So Johnson made all these connections, but when it came to actually persuading people, he would, he would use his imposing physical presence. Now, I won't, I won't go into all of the gory details, because some of the details are rather gory. I'll, I'll keep it uh, for family audiences. But what he used to do is the half Johnson consisted of taking a legislator who was on the borderline, couldn't decide whether to go along or not, and invite him into the Oval Office. Or before that, when he was majority leader, in the majority leader's office. Invite them into the office. And he would sort of sidle up next to them, and then he would throw an arm around them in a very friendly fashion, and start talking about the merits of this piece of legislation, and how it was good for the country, and it would be good for them, and it was good for the party, and they really ought to get on board. And if they still hesitated, then he would draw them a little bit closer. He was a big guy. And he had a really big head, very imposing. And he would draw them closer, and then he would start tapping them on the chest. And his big, long index finger, these great big hands, and he'd start thumping them on the chest. <laughs> and they wouldn't know what to do. They'd never been treated this way. <laughs> and they they would realize very quickly that they weren't going to be released <laughs> until they said yes. Well, those who resisted the half Johnson were sometimes subjected to the full Johnson. Not just one arm around, but both arms around. And Johnson would go forehead to forehead. And when he got excited, as he often did, when he was speaking on behalf of something that he thought was important, the spit would fly out of his mouth. <laughs> And there they were, trapped. There's one great picture that shows up in a lot of, well, in fact, it shows up, uh, Gleaves uses a textbook I'm the co-author of. There's a picture of Johnson and Senator Theodore Green. And Johnson is actually restraining himself, I guess, because he knows there's a cameraman present. But he's leaning over Green like this. Green is a relatively short guy. And Green is kind of leaning back. <laughs> anyway, by these means, by other means, by promising favors, if people would come on board, by persuading Everett Dirksen, the Senate minority leader from Illinois, that the time had come to live up to the promise of that other great son of Illinois, Abraham Lincoln, that Dirksen should convince the Republicans to get on board. Johnson got his civil rights bill but he knew what it would cost. On the night that he signed the Civil Rights Bill, he took his personal secretary, Bill Moyers, another Texan aside, and he said, Bill, we have just delivered the South to the Republican Party for the next generation. Now for Johnson, a lifelong Democrat, a person whose political fortunes had always been tied to the Democratic Party, this was a very serious consequence. And Johnson was as astute a student of American politics as has ever lived. And he was absolutely right. Until the 1960s, the South had been democratic to a man and a woman. Well, democratic to a white man and woman, but they were the only ones who voted. So they were the only ones who counted. However, Johnson recognized that Southerners were only Democrats because they were still replaying the battles of James Buchanan and Abraham Lincoln. They were still refighting the Civil War. And the Civil War had been a Republican project. Memories in the South go way back. And people, Southern conservatives, far more conservative than the average Republican in the nation at large were Democrats because their pappies had been Democrats and their grandpappies had been Democrats all the way back to, shoot, in some cases Andrew Jackson. Johnson's embrace of civil rights, a Democratic president, a Democratic president in favor of civil rights, he got his bill, but he gave permission for all those conservative Southerners to gravitate from the party of their childhood and their ancestry to the party of their, what shall I call it, their ideology, their belief system. And starting in 1965, continuing through the 60s into the 70s, the South went Republican. Now the South 
is the home of the Republican Party. The center of gravity of the Republican Party is no longer in its birthplace in places like Michigan. The center of gravity is of the Republican Party is in the South. And Lyndon Johnson's prediction was borne out with a vengeance. But he did it because he thought it was right and the country is much better off for it. Now Lyndon Johnson has a lot on his record, has a lot on his conscience. We can blame him for all sorts of things including the war in Vietnam. You can blame him if you want for the excesses of the great society. And in his desire to outdo Franklin Roosevelt, he probably did carry a lot of things too far. But if you remember one thing about Lyndon Johnson, remember that he pushed civil rights legislation through. He changed with that bill and the companion piece, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he changed the face of American society. And, hey, to make it contemporary, he made it possible for somebody like Barack Obama to credibly contest for the presidency of the United States. I will stop there and see if I've said anything that provokes questions. I hope I have. Yes, Mandy. I think you know about this story that you said you tell us about <laughs> It has nothing to do with the presidency, but it does have something to do with teaching. So, shall I, should I tell the story? Or? Sure. All right. You'll remember that I was talking about how teachers and public speakers get this sense of what's working and what's not, and they, you know, they tend to be encouraged by what's working. When I was in college, I took a class in behavioral psychology. And behavioral psychology is the branch of psychology that tries to change behaviors. It doesn't so much probe into the psyche, but it tries to get organisms, eventually people, to change their behavior. B.F. Skinner was one of the pioneers of behavioral technology, uh, behavioral psychology, and he managed to teach pigeons to play ping pong. <laughs> Who would have thought it? But you can do it. The way you do it is, you put a pigeon on a ping pong table. <laughs> Take down the net. Just put a pigeon on a ping pong table and roll a ping pong ball at the pigeon. And if the pigeon kind of looks at the ping pong ball or moves toward the ping pong ball, you reward the pigeon. You feed him a piece of corn or whatever pigeons like. Okay? And so the pigeon Pigeon doesn't know what's going on, but the pigeon realizes, if I do this, I get rewarded. Okay, so the next step is to, you make it, you have to raise the bar, so to speak. And so what you do then is, the next step, you make the pigeon take a step toward the ping pong ball and then sort of aim to peck the ping pong ball. And the pigeon doesn't know, you don't tell a pigeon anything, pigeons wouldn't know what you're saying anyway. But if just by random, the pigeon will do this now and then. And when, you, when the pigeon does it, then you reward it. And you no longer reward it simply for looking in the direction of the ping pong ball. So you channel the behavior in the direction you want. Next step, the pigeon has to sort of flutter a wing toward the ping pong ball to get rewarded. And eventually the pigeons catch on and they do it. Until now, you bounce the ball toward the pigeon and the pigeon has to, actually has to hit the ball with his wing. Okay? To get rewarded. And then you bring up the net. And now the pigeon has to hit the ball back over the net before it gets rewarded. And Skinner showed you can actually do this. And you can get pigeons to play ping pong. I don't know if they're any good, but hey, it's kind of like the person who said, was asked when he saw a dog walking on its hind legs. Well, you know, is that dog pretty good at walking on its hind legs? It's beside the point if it's good, it's walking on its hind legs. Anyway, so. I was told this story. I cannot vouch for its accuracy, but it, it sounds reasonable that there was a previous version of this beha the behavioral psychology class that I was in where the students were all required to come up with an experiment in behavioral psychology. And they were going to have to you know, do the experiment where they would modify something, some animal or some person's behavior. 